to go, uh, go out to the Davises this week and uh, get to meet Susan, uh, Sue, I suppose, for the first time. Uh, wonderful meeting. And I will say this, I thought this was funny. As I was getting ready to go, you know, I threw on a jacket and I went out there uh, and, you know, we sat out on their porch. You know, he was wearing a, a t-shirt, shorts, no problem. I had jacket, you know, uh, some kind of a shirt on and, and long pants. I was kind of getting a little bit chilly at the end there and no problem, not a single shiver from Bill. So <laughs> I thought, okay, I have some time to acclimate. Um, but again, I really enjoyed it. So um, now I know this week we all have been busy and uh, we bring that busyness uh, from our life to this point. So uh, let's take some time. We're going to read uh, the Beatitudes together and then we'll pray and and allow the Lord to reorient our life around his will. So let's go ahead and uh, open to Matthew 5, 3 through 10. Matthew 5, 3 through 10. Blessed are the pure, or sorry, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who, uh, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, sorry, the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we can come together as your children, as one body to receive your word, to allow you to speak into our life. I pray, Father, that you would call us forward in Christ, that we might be your children and testimony in this city. I pray that you would crucify my flesh, that it might not be my agenda that would prevail, but that your word would be exalted, would enter our hearts, Father, and change us and call us out as your children into this world, again, to show the testimony of Christ, to glorify him, to uh, reach those who are hurting, um, and to live in this life as in, in holiness for all to see. I pray, Father, that uh, you would cause this word to take root in our faith and bear fruit to your glory. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So we come to this blessing. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Here, Jesus is speaking into the deepest recesses of our heart with this blessing. He is demanding individual circumspection. And identifying that it is not merely the external characteristics of our life that matter, but the condition of our heart as well. In the same way that one cannot see light unless your eye is whole, so you also cannot see God unless your heart is pure. Now, as iron sharpens iron, I like to look at other uh, what other Christians have uh, written and observed about certain texts, and there is a uh, some commentary from uh, an early church writer called uh, Chrysostom. I have a hard time saying his name. Uh, he lived around um, 345 to 407, and he commented as follows. For there are many who show mercy, who refuse to rob others, and who are not covetous, but who still may remain entangled in sins like fornication and licentiousness. Jesus adds these words to indicate that the former virtues do not suffice in and of themselves. The reason I bring this forward in this blessing is because quite oftentimes today we think that as long as I am socially just towards others, it does not matter the condition my heart. But here we find that is not true. We know Jesus, and we will touch on this later, that he tells us that it's from our heart that the issues of life spring forward. 
And so if we have a heart that is impure, we cannot live in holiness, true holiness before God, even if we carry out uh, individual acts of compassion and kindness. So as we go into this lesson, we must ask what it means to be pure in heart as we approach this blessing. Some will understand this to refer to moral purity, and others take it to uh, refer to inward wholeness, i.e. A, a heart that is free from the tyranny of a divided self. We'll talk about this later as we move forward. I think we gain a little bit of insight into this word um, if we understand how it is used. And it is frequently used in ancient Greek literature um, to refer to being purged. Uh, it, it's a, a word for army. So it's, it's used in the military uh, of an incident when they purge a unit of all the cowardly uh, and um, discontented soldiers. So, for example, when David had to go out to war and he had to purge his army, this is what he was doing. He was, in this sense, making his unit pure, right? Another use for this word uh, is it was used for purifying milk or wine, keeping it unadulterated with water. So if your wine was pure, it had not been cut with water. That's the senses in which this word was used. So I'm going to suggest this as we move forward for a, a, a um, actionable uh, definition for this word. I suggest that we bring these two together. I think Jesus has both in mind, and I will show you why. So I would say that pure in heart refers to the inward condition of a sincere personal wholeness that produces moral purity in our life. And I believe this is reasonable in view of what Jesus taught in Matthew 15. He said that what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. For the, from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, and slanders. Our heart must not be inwardly divided, yearning for both righteousness and unrighteousness. We, we need to remember, especially, I think, in our time, that our divided hearts are the fundamental problem of the human race. All of Christ's doctrine, everything that we learn from him, all of the moral teachings depend on the condition of one's heart. Wisdom tells us in Proverbs uh, 4, guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Deuteronomy tells us, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul, with all of your strength. We guard our heart against what can enter in to defile it, because it is the heart by which we worship God. It is our heart by which we follow Christ. Indeed, you remember, God does not even accept obedience if it does not come from the heart, does he? He wishes our hearts to be entirely loyal to him. And that is why wisdom tells us to guard what enters our heart. And, and again, in our time with so much access into our heart from the outside world, we have to be very careful what we allow to touch us and impress us. The prophet, though, warns us about the condition of the human race in our heart. Jeremiah says in chapter 17, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? The psalmist writes, for 40 years, God was disgusted with that generation. Therefore, he said, they are people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my ways. This is the condition of the human heart. It is not fundamentally loyal to God. It is disloyal. It follows its own passions. And this is where we stand 
as a fallen race. Therefore, when Jesus issues this blessing, he is referring to a condition that cannot rightly describe any person in their natural state of being. He refers to the condition of the new creation. So how do we become pure? What is the hope for our heart? Well, this is first and foremost the supernatural work of God. We, we know that uh, Jeremiah the prophet, he referred and he asked, how can a leopard change its spots? That's how unchangeable human nature is. And you'll forgive me for a moment, but there is a uh, TV show, I suppose it's really not new anymore, um, but called House, and it follows a doctor, and, and House is in, an incurably atheistic in his outlook, and one of the things he consistently says, people don't change. They can be modified by selfish ambition, but he is such a skeptic, the undying skeptic, that he always says, people do not change. Now, we find that in this, uh, he agrees with scripture. The leopard cannot change his spots. You cannot be made fundamentally different on your own. And so the prophet Ezekiel speaks of God's supernatural work. And we must not forget this is a supernatural work. And he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, a living heart, a sensitive heart. This is the supernatural work of God in Ezekiel's prophecy, along with the one uh, that matches it in Jeremiah, is the foundation of the new covenant. As Christians, we partake of that new covenant in Christ. God accomplishes this supernatural work in those who are broken and desperate for him. The psalmist pleads, God Create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. These have been the blessings, the beatitudes that we have looked at up to this point. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, that have been made humble, that hunger and thirst for righteousness. This describes the brokenness and the appetite that God blesses with a new heart. For many, the one thing that prevents them from ever being made new is that they cannot be made low and empty. They refuse to become broken. And as humans, we don't like brokenness. That's a good thing in, in one sense because brokenness can be weak and it, and it can lead to your ruin. And so we, we don't want to be broken. We want to be strong. And so we refuse to let go. We refuse to be humbled by God. In a sense, we don't trust God enough to be broken around him. But God blesses the brokenhearted. He blesses those who are emptied of themselves. And he says, I will bless you with the greatest blessing. I will make you new. I will make you whole. God begins this work in us through the cleansing of Christ's blood when we call upon his name in baptism. Ephesians tells us, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace. What a wonderful thing that we, although we were helpless and we were desperate, it was God who looked on us with compassion in that state. And he said, I will shed my blood. I will cleanse you and make you whole from the inside out. I will take those wounds, and by my wounds, I will heal yours. In Acts 22, 16, Ananias preaches to Paul. I suppose I should say he's uh, sharing his testimony of what happened earlier. And he says, and now, Ananias preaches, why are you delaying? 
Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Again in Colossians, the same Paul writes, you also were circumcised in him, in Christ, with a circumcision not done with human hands, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through the faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave all of your trespasses. It is God who begins this work in you. And it is God who completes this work. He takes the brokenness. He begins to heal us. And he takes that flesh that is so opposed to God that is so set on our own ways, stubbornly, even though time and time again we learn that it only leads to ruin and disaster. We're helplessly set on our own ways. And he begins to cut that away. And he slowly begins to make us new, cutting away that extra excess. And if you think about circumcision, what that is, that is what God does to our hearts. He clears away that excess flesh. We had a brother in many countries, children are not uh, circumcised at birth, and um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, and one of these brothers, for some reason, a medical condition needed to be circumcised. And so when I went through this passage, uh, he relayed what it is like for an adult male to be circumcised in adulthood. And it's painful. <laughs> And, you know, he describes the pain that we go through in some sense. It is a very real, excruciating pain that we oftentimes go through when God begins this circumcision in our life. How many of you had had, have had sins that just refused to let go? And they had to be painfully cut away from your life. It's the grace of God. He does this work in our hearts, bearing with the pain and the mess that has resulted. And that begins as we call upon him when we are baptized and become the covenant children of God. But this work continues. It is not a one-time and finished thing. I've met many who treat, in one sense, baptism like a magic card. And they think I've been baptized, therefore I'm done. The work is completed. And I don't have to do anything the rest of my life. That's not how that works. If it were, we would be sinlessly perfect the moment we were baptized. We would enter the state that we will be in in eternity. But that is not how that works. It is also a sanctification, a process that is carried out in our life. And I, I, I refer to this as the process of the daily cross. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It is that daily process of hearing the Lord call, responding by faith and obedience, that we are slowly but surely conformed to the likeness of our Savior. Again, Paul writes, in Ephesians 4, 17 through 25, and, and you may indeed want to turn there and, and look at this because it's a decent section in length and it's very important. Uh, could I have my water, please? Right before I got up on stage, I was thinking, get your water, get your water, and then I forgot. Then bring it up with me. Okay, Ephesians 4, 17. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thoughts. What is this? Their thoughts being divided. Their thoughts not being fully set one way or the other. Have you ever met anybody that is entirely wicked? 
whose every single thought is always harsh, not usually. Usually there's a little bit of confliction. We want to do something good, and so we try to do some nice things and some good things, but we are uh, predisposed in a harsh and cruel and wicked direction. And so when test comes, we go the wrong way. Our thoughts are empty towards God. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. Not sensitive to the things of God, nor can they. Their hearts are dead. They are not able to be sensitive to his will. This is again why God says that this empty religious tradition that's based on the human traditions, human doctrine, is futile. It cannot make your heart alive. That is exclusively the supernatural work of God. Verse 19, they became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus to take off your former way of life and the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on a new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members one of another. It is this renewing that Paul describes that Jesus himself is blessing, that as you begin to have that old way done away with, to put away, to have the darkness of your heart and mind illuminated by Christ, that you might become pure, that all of your thoughts and your affections become united in Christ, you might be made new. Paul tells us again in Galatians 5, 22, this is the work of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions and desires. Therefore, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. You see this process over and over again in Scripture because God never wants us to disassociate the morality and the purity that he calls us to, to live by, from the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't accomplish this on your own. And so he says, you must keep in step with the Holy Spirit. And how oftentimes in our lives do we, we, we set out to do good, and we hope to do something good, and we find ourselves coming short because we began to think in ways that are supposed to be put off. We think according to the flesh, and it does not lead to the righteousness of God when tested. Now here, this week as I was praying, I was seeking a word of exhortation from God to deliver to you. Something that needs to be brought out to touch our hearts. And I believe that he brought this passage to my mind. It's in Hebrews 12, 14 through 15. The author here is concluding a very powerful book, and he speaks in this passage about entering the presence of God. That, of course, I know is our desire, how we long to come into the presence of our creator. We desire fellowship with him. And he says this, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. 
Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. The author of Hebrews is warning us that the kind of resentment and anger that takes root in our hearts, that causes trouble and defiles people's souls, must not be allowed to take root in our hearts. He tells us to ensure that no one falls, meaning that we are supposed to watch out for one another in order to stir up love and good works in each other's hearts. This holiness is what you have been called to by God, to share in his nature, because God is holy, and that is why he tells us to be holy, because we are his children. And he says, not only do I call you to be holy, but I equip you with the power to do so, because I live in you. I conform you to my nature, and I make you holy so that you might share in my glory. This warning is meant to be received, to make it clear, in light of the nature and character of God. In Leviticus, you'll remember that Nadab and Abihu brought forward their worship to God in a way that was not authorized by God. And so he struck them down. They approached the Holy of Holy. Well, it wasn't the Holy of Holies. The, um, well, anyway, they approached a holy function without holiness. He struck them down. He killed them. And, and Moses turns to Aaron. And he says this, it is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. We have re received an invitation into, to come into the holy presence of God. But I will tell you that in many cases, because of erroneous teaching, we treat this lightly. We believe we can come into the presence of God flippantly, without reverence or honor. And worst of all, we believe we can come with our hearts set on impurity, with our hearts divided from God. And because we seek communion, fellowship, and I'm not talking about the Lord's Supper when I say communion, when we, when we seek fellowship, with God, in that state, he does not reciprocate that. And that leads to emptiness, dryness, to rote observation of law on the one hand, or on sensual, carnal expressions of religion. It leads to false religion because we find when we get there, it's all empty. So we say, I've got to make something, some experience for myself. We have to approach the throne of God in holiness. So let us remember, we are to be holy in Christ. And by that I mean we receive the holiness of Christ and are clothed in him. That is that supernatural work of God. Being clothed in him. We do not then proceed to rebuild what he has crucified. Rather, we are to be transformed by the Holy Spirit in holiness through obedience to God's word. Being fully clothed in his righteousness, we now begin to be conformed inside out by day by day picking up that cross denying ourselves and obeying him in faith. This transforms us fundamentally. It changes our desires. We are then to be holy in our community relationships. This is where the holiness that God works in us begins to be expressed. As we relate to our neighbors and our co-workers, we relate to them in holiness, not with wrath, and anger, dissension, not with slander towards anyone, 
But as God has loved us, so we also turn to love others. We are gracious to them in our speech. We are kind to those who have fallen. It was interesting to me. I watched the, 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 the presidential debate, and of course I was online watching people's reactions simultaneously. And that can be a bit of a circus, I'll just tell you, it's a little bit kind of entertaining on one side, but it's also a little heartbreaking because I saw people hoping, wishing for their enemy to stumble. Whichever candidate they support, they were wishing for the other one to fall. Destruction on the other. You're free to disagree with me here. I do not feel that that is the testimony of Christ. I do not believe that is how he related to us when we were enemies of God. I believe he wants us to pray for whatever candidate you think is despicable, or both, if that's your position. I believe he wants us to pray for that one. I believe he wants us to relate to those who like that one with compassion and understanding. Because that is how he relates to us. Even when we are stubborn, even as his children, we oftentimes still are deceived and go astray, don't we? We oftentimes don't understand something. I don't know about you. I can be very dense. It takes me some time to get something through my thick head. And God did not cast me off. He didn't say, well, hey, I mean, you're baptized. I gave you my grace. And now you're still messing it up? Really? All right, go find someone else. I'm going to put you. He didn't do that to me. Are we then going to do that to others? So Paul, I believe, brings this exhortation, this little uh, hiccup in the middle of my sermon. He brings it into focus for us. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. Speaking about a spiritual condition, but it's equally applicable to a political, civil state of being. He says, for you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. We must be careful that we do not use our liberty as an opportunity to exercise our flesh and thereby turn against those God has called us to love, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and our enemies, basically everyone. We must have undivided hearts, being wholly controlled by the love of Christ and possessing the requisite courage necessary to enter this dark world and love the unlovable, even as God did for us. Now, to continue with our primary message here on this beatitude, the blessing itself is to see God. The blessing that Jesus is bestowing upon those who are pure in heart is that they shall see God. Jesus tells us that for the person whose heart bursts with a desire to see God, the craving of our souls is only ever satisfied in personal holiness. Now, this blessing is experienced in two phases. It is experienced now and in eternity. Now, we inwardly see God in Christ Jesus with our heart through faith. In eternity, we will see him face to face. No veil, no separation. We will see God face to face in eternity. Now, in the here and now in time, we see the glory of God in Christ Jesus. And we should inwardly see this glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, referring to the creation, 
has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. What a remarkable blessing that in us, God has chosen to enter your heart to show his glory in the light of Christ. And we should have that vision of Christ in our heart. The world should not obscure the joy that we experience being in his presence inwardly, having him dwell in us and fill us. In Hebrews 1, 3, understand who it is that dwells in our heart by faith. Hebrews 1, 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. You see, Christ is the fullness of God. That is who we are meant to have fellowship with. And again, this is the problem with rote religion, human tradition. It emulates the commandments, but it denies the power of godliness. It is empty in substance. Sure, you might go and follow this tradition. You might find these ordinances and so you'll have a reason to elevate yourself, feeling righteous. But inwardly, you're still empty. You still don't have this, the radiance of God's glory. And that is what we hunger for. We hunger to be filled with our creator because we were created in his likeness. We were created for fellowship with him. Nothing else will do, and that is why the author of Hebrews says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. But this amazing blessing is also experienced in eternity. There is a coming age when the veil that separates us from God will be torn apart and we will have his real presence face to face unveiled this is what the the psalmist's heart cries out for psalm 24 1 through 5 the earth and everything in it the world and its inhabitants belong to the lord for he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers who may ascend the mountain of the lord who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the, uh, from the God of his salvation. Many understand this to be the psalm Jesus is drawing from for this blessing that the God of all creation, the one to whom we belong has said the pure in heart will enter my presence and I will bless them with me. They will see and behold me. What amazing blessing we have. The blessing of for the pure in heart is God himself. John the Revelator, as he is sometimes called in antiquity, uh, describes the day of glory when we will enter God's presence. If you go to Revelation 21, we will read verses 9 through 11, and then we'll skip to verses 22 through 27. Revelation 21, 9 through 11. Then one of the seven angels who had, come, who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. He then carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. 
coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now here we, we see this picture, the bride, that's the body of Christ, descending out of heaven, coming down in glory, being clothed in the glory of Christ himself. Can you imagine that? We are going to one day shed these mortal bodies. We're going to shed all of the guilt that we sometimes carry on, even though we've been forgiven of Christ now. We sometimes still carry the scars of our past. All of that will be shed, and you will be fully clothed in the glory of God. You know, I, I am under no delusions about my, my body. I don't want to retain this any longer than I must. Because I know what is coming is that much greater than what we have here. Revelation uh, 21, 22 through 27. He's looking at this city, the body of Christ, the church. And he says something strange for the people of God. He says, I did not see a temple in it because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it. And its lamp is the Lamb. Jesus Christ is the means by which the glory of God is displayed to his creation. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never close by day, because it will never be night there. They will, sh they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Here we are, we come into the presence of God, he himself being our temple. We no longer go into something that is outside of God to worship him. We go into the presence of God himself, this holy being, this being who is beyond our description, beyond our understanding, even beyond our ability as humans to tolerate. You remember that God is described as being the one whose face no one can look upon and live. His essence is simply too intense for mortals to bear. We're coming into that presence we're entering into his presence to worship him for eternity, to have fellowship with this being. And that is why he said, be holy, for I am holy. I'll provide the means for you to be holy. I'll give you the power to be holy. But you must be holy to enter my presence. I will not tolerate in eternity any immorality any detestable or false thing. That is the, the nature of God himself. We have been given the unique blessing of God, therefore, to come into his dwelling place. Sometimes I fear that we are so distracted by the affairs of this world that we overlook what this blessing really means. Week in, week out, our jobs, the election, the next election, the next election, getting fired, friends getting fired, everything distracts us. And that now that we have, that coming into his presence now, having him seeing the light of Christ and his glory, by faith in our heart and fellowshipping with him there sometimes becomes as foreign to us as much of the gospel is to the world. 
that is a terrifying state to be in. We fail to grasp what we have access to in Christ because, just like Peter, we are so fixated on the storms around us that we miss the presence of Almighty God in our midst. Now, I want to share a, a personal testimony here, a personal story as we conclude. I will never forget this particular blessing, Matthew 5 8, because it has been imprinted onto my life in a way that's very real back in 2014. I think I've alluded to this story before, but one morning I woke up and I just had a little speck in my eye and I thought, oh, that's annoying. And so I got out of bed and I went to the sink to wash it out. I tried to wash the speck out, couldn't get it out. So I got into the shower thinking, well, that'll get it out, but it would not come out. And I began to realize something else is going on. So I looked at my eye and I was trying to find, is there something in my eye that I can't get rid of easily? There was nothing there, nothing visible on the surface of my eye. So over the course of the afternoon, the black spot in my vision began to grow. I started to realize, well, debris does not grow. Something's going on. And so when Mary came home from work, we talked about it. We ended up calling her mother. And my mother-in-law told us to go to the ER. She said, well, you could have a brain bleed. And that could be fatal. So we went to the ER. And by the time I was able to be put into the MRI machine, my eye had gone completely black. Dark as night. Couldn't see a single thing in my left eye. Couldn't see any light. You know, he waved the little doodad in front of you and he's looking in. My eye was completely healthy. Couldn't see anything. I was blind completely, 100% lost vision. So they put me in the MRI machine and the nurse asked, do you want those headphones? And, you know, they could put the gear on you and kind of try to get you to escape the moment. I declined. And I began praying. And in just a perfect calmness and peace, I began praying and worshiping God. Now, that's difficult because you have to stay perfectly still. But nonetheless, I prayed and was worshiping God. And at that time, a sense of joy came over me as the Lord brought this very passage to my mind, Matthew 5, 8. Throughout my entire life, I have used my eyes in the most wicked manner possible to satisfy the lusts of the flesh, and they are many. I understood in that moment that I do not deserve my eyesight. God would be just perfectly just to have taken my eyesight away completely. I've used it for wicked means. What demand could I make before my God to say, restore my sight? He would simply reply, why? So you can use it in ways I find abominable. Then the profoundness of God's saving work in my life dawned on me. He has made me pure so that I could receive a greater vision than that which was minute by minute fading from my eyesight. God was day by day changing the disposition of my soul and the affections of my heart. God had become the sole desire of my heart. I was not terrified. I was concerned about certain things, but those concerns faded in view of what I receive in Christ every day, of what he had done in my life, which could not be taken away. No one can snatch you from the presence of God. You remain faithful to him. Your eyesight, of him, your vision of your Savior cannot be taken. And I can honestly say that I have inwardly seen God by faith, in the radiate, radiance of Christ. It is this testimony that has imprinted on me how incredibly valuable it is for you to see God. I encourage you, do not take that for granted. Do not let 
those temporary passing things in this world, our concerns about our children, even as they grow and become adults and begin to have their own children, all of these things are passing away. Don't let this election cause your heart to become bitter and defiled, thus blinding you to Christ. It's not worth it. Let me ask you, is, is Biden or is President Trump worth not being able to see God? Not for a moment. I love them both. I pray for their soul. I'm just a peon and there's very little I will ever be able to do to touch either of their lives, but I certainly would if I could. Pray for them. But here's the point. Don't let anything rob you of your vision of Christ nor distract you from his glory. He's everything to us. I hope it becomes immediately evident now how this radically changes our view of the Bible's moral teachings. And it must, because we're coming up to those moral teachings, the foundation in the New Testament of the moral doctrine of God. These moral teachings are not meant to function as a checklist of strongly worded suggestions or even binding laws. We are not meant to see them as ideals, as excellent as Martin Luther was. I disagree with him strongly on that point. We, the laws of God are not meant to be ideals, high ideals, to which we strive. Rather, they reveal the heart that God is working out in us by the power of the Holy Spirit as we obey his word through faith. Our one consuming passion is to see God, and this is our testimony to the world. Let's pray, and we will uh, continue our, or we'll move on. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for this incredible blessing that though we had rebelled against you in the hardness of our hearts, you did not see fit to abandon us. You did not see fit to draw away but you took on our likeness, became flesh, and came to become a sacrifice to cleanse us of our sins, to redeem us, and, and bring us back to you that we might one day see you unveiled and see your glory dwelling in the midst of Christ, seeing your glory displayed through Christ in eternity. Father, I pray that the power of the Spirit would take this word and implant it in our faith, and by that would bear fruit to your glory. Father, that you would conform us and transform us from the inside out. Father, that our vision of you would grow day by day. It would not decrease in any moment, even as the kingdom and its increase never decreases because of Christ. So we pray our vision will continue to grow day by day. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's turn now to number 671 and sing the second and third verses before the closing prayer. You need to come forward for prayers and encouragement and come forward as we stand and sing this song. Stand. 